about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. To infinity and beyond! Some people without brains do an awful lot of talking, don't they? It's classified. You talking to me? I could tell you, but then I'd have to kill you. I can't lie! Expecto Patronum! Entertainment X. You never know what you're going to get. For this episode, I sit down and chat with Frank Delella. He's the onstage host for Spectrum News, New York One, and we sit in their beautiful studios in Chelsea and have a wonderful conversation about what got him into journalism and reporting and what got him associated with Spectrum News. It's a really, really wonderful conversation, and at the end of it, he adds some wonderful sentiments on what's important to him in his life and I do believe that all of us can learn from what Frank shared so I hope you enjoy this episode and keep on keeping on we're back I'm Clayton Howe and today with me is Frank Delella. Frank thank you for taking the time to sit down with me today thank you so much for having me I'm so excited to do this this is fun we're in um was Spectrum News New York One's center of the universe here I mean this is gorgeous <laughs> Did you know this was the former set of the TV show Oz? No, this I was didn't the prison. know that. Yeah. No way. And now it's New York One. I love it. I absolutely love it. Um, we're going to jump right in. We're going to go back Let's to the beginning of time for you. Let's do it. Back in Philly. What were your journalism dreams? You know, like many people who eventually moved to New York City, I grew up wanting to be an actor. So I really didn't have my eyes set on being a journalist. When I was a kid in Philadelphia, although I was a weird kid, so my favorite TV shows were Dateline NBC and America's Most Wanted and Unsolved Mysteries. And of course, I watched the presenters on all those shows and thought to myself, you know what, if the acting thing never works out, maybe I'll be the next John Walsh or Stone Phillips or even Jane Pauley. So yeah. um, that was always in the back of my mind. But I really did, as a kid, want to be an actor. And I moved to New York like many of us do looking to pursue my dreams as a performer. But things obviously went a different way, and I'm very, very happy and proud of uh, what happened, I shall say. Okay. No, I and I agree. Uh, America's Most Wanted. I'm a fan of that growing <laughs> up. We might be the only two theater kids that enjoy that show. Yes. <laughs> it was more of like the, the, dr the drama and the theatricality of yes. it, I shall say. Yeah, what were what what stood out to you in those? I mean, if anything, watching those interviews, watching those conversations, was there curiosity? I think there were many thrillers. You know, watching to see who these people were and you know what they were doing, and I was always happy when um, you know there would be an update at the end of the 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 program, and you'd see and such and such John Smith was caught in New York City, and yeah, and then I would. Tell my brother, okay, so we're, we're safe at home. We're safe at home. <laughs> and I want to go to New York City. <laughs> yes, I want to go to New York City. <laughs> what did your parents teach you about work ethic growing up? You know, I grew up uh, in a household where both my mom and dad were workaholics. My mom uh, worked for, at first, Bell Atlantic, which eventually turned into Verizon, um, where uh, she was a VP of. And my father mm -hmm. worked for the Postal Service. Um, he he uh, was in... Uh, part of the labor relations uh, department. Okay. And he also had a side business. He was a landscaper. So, you know, not, my parents worked nonstop. My mom, you know, was constantly on the road. So growing up, my dad played Mr. Mom with my grandmother also being there. And um, so the time with my parents, with my mother really was on the weekends. And one of our favorite activities was to come to New York City to see Broadway shows. And I remember that at a very early age, you know, the, the New York Times would come on a Saturday morning, I'd run outside, grab the Times, my mom would say, just pick shows you want to see. And we would go up, you know, two, three times a month to see literally everything on Broadway, both me and my brother. Do you remember the first one? Of course, you always remember your first one. Um, <laughs> it, it, my first Broadway experience was seeing the National Tour of Cats. I was about five years old. That was in Philadelphia, and I did not want to leave the theater. And I remember my mother saying, Frank, we have to leave the theater. But I didn't want to leave the theater. And to this day, Cats, uh, uh, I hold a very special place in my heart for Cats. Um, and my first Broadway show was Phantom of the Opera. Again, an Andrew Lloyd Webber show, but... I was about six or seven years old, and I remember coming to New York, taking the train up, going to Mama Leone's, which is no longer in existence, <laughs> in Times Square, and then going to see 
Phantom and then going to the Broadway gift shop and buying, I think, the cassette recording of The Secret Garden and a bunch of other shows. Bit by the bug. Yes, bit by the bug. Did you do a lot of performing? I did. After that. Well, even during that time, you know, my mom chose, my brother and I went to a private school on the main line right outside of Philadelphia. And so, yeah. um, of course, we wanted to go to the local school where all our, where mm -hmm. I'm older. I went to go to the local school where all my friends were going in the neighborhood. But my mom said, no, just trust me. You're going to go to a private school. It's a different school. And at the end of the day, I realized the reason why she picked the school was because every spring they did a big musical. They would hire um, the orchestra folks who did all the national tours in Philadelphia. They would play, so they would hire like a 20 plus piece orchestra to play, um, you know, everything from over the years we did The Music Man and The Sound of Music and The Pirates of Penzance and The Wizard of Oz and Once Upon a Mattress and Joseph. So um, yeah, so I did a lot of performing growing up and then I did stuff in the community. I did stuff in high school. I went to an all boys prep school. So I would do both the show, the musical at my school and then the show at the all girls school. Wow. Yeah. A lot of performing growing Busy. up. Busy. So, okay. So break this down for me. What was the transition then from, you know, high school to college, theater to journalism? Where was that? How did that arc? How did that change? So I moved to New York City in 2002 to go to Fordham University at Lincoln Center. I started, you know, thinking that I was going to be in the acting program, doing the acting track. I got to New York and realized very shortly thereafter that um, I was in a very talented class. Yeah. Um, and I should think of maybe a plan B in my class. Uh, I went to school and lived next door to Taylor Schilling who um, is the lead on Orange is the New Black, very talented actress, as well as my buddy Van Hughes, who just got cast in Almost Famous on Broadway, or soon to be on Broadway. Um, it's done a bunch of Broadway shows. Um, my friend Michaela McManus, who's on The Village on NBC. So very, very talented class. And um, it was my sophomore year, and or actually the summer of my sophomore into junior year and i applied for an internship in new york one and i was also up for a production of hair at the gallery players in brooklyn and i got a call back for hair and i said to myself if i get hair i will continue pursuing the theater dream if mm -hmm. you will sure. If I don't get hair, it's time to think of plan B. I ended up not getting hair, but I got the internship in New York One. And that was kind of my new track. And I got here, and the moment I got here, they put me um, in the living unit, as it used to be called. And they asked if I would intern with their theater show on stage. And I thought I had died and gone to heaven seeing that this was journalism and covering the Broadway scene, the off-Broadway scene, and everything New York theater. And my very first day, they sent me out on a shoot to, um, to cover something at the Culture Project downtown, and I knew that this was right. Yeah. Yeah. That's, you know, and I was having this conversation yesterday about being flexible mm -hmm. in your life path. That's right. And not forcing it. That's right. And has that gotten easier for you, or has that always been the case? You've just let it kind of you know follow where it's taking you you know i've always been someone who likes to know what the next step is and likes Same. to have <laughs> likes to have a whole plan in place yeah. Oh, yeah. um i like structure in my life but you know when things present themselves to me um i've learned over the years to kind of just go with it yeah. and um yeah okay so you're interning here and what are you learning what are you seeing what are you witnessing the person who was the onstage reporter at the time, you know, during her various vacations, they would send me out to do stories and to cover opening nights. So I was getting reporting one on one or experiencing reporting firsthand. You know, I'm a very curious person. So I would say, you know, if I have downtime, let me sit at the news desk and learn that process. Let me yeah. sit with an editor and learn that process. So I was able to kind of experience everything all the elements if you will on how to tell a story here at new york one and then that shortly after that i interned here uh for two internships back to back mm. the summer of 05 i then um 
took an office job at Barlow Hartman, which was one of the press offices here in New York City, um, and at the time covered or had accounts like The Color Purple and Dirty Rotten Scoundrels and All Shook Up and Sweet Charity with Christina Applegate. So I learned the whole PR element and then came mm. back to New York One the fall of my senior year, and that's when they hired me to be a news shooter. So I would then go out and do cover all new stuff. And then that led to being on the overnight assignment desk. So I experienced that whole element. And I just kind of... What was that? Was that like midnight to... It, yeah, five? you would come in at 1030 at night and then okay. leave at 7 in the morning. Oh, and it was intense. You know, during that time, it was like... Um, I, was in, I was just finishing my senior year at Fordham and... You know, all my friends were going on spring break and senior week, and I was here at New York One doing my thing, working, and I thought to myself, you know what, this is going to pay off. This is going to pay off. It's nice and, when you know And that. it did. It yeah. Did. What? So, okay, so overnight then, what are you, are you covering like uh, breaking news or like reviewing shows and new shows? You know what <laughs> I mean? Like what? No theater. No, this is your mon- <laughs> you're monitoring the police scanners. You are. The stuff. It's, it's, it's hardcore news. It yeah. Is. Yeah, have you? Was there ever a preference to go into that after watching like America's Most Wanted, or were you like it was, you saw that whole on stage thing and you're like, mm, okay. I gotta, I gotta be honest with you. You know, I love feature reporting. I love covering the theater. I love covering entertainment. So I think that's where my heart has been and mm. will always be. Yeah. But um, you know, being an overnight assignment editor and even going out and shooting things in the field um, and covering hard news, you learn things that um, you can apply to anything. You know what I mean? Like, especially in those situations, it's fast and furious and you have to think on your feet and kind of just go with your gut. And I feel like those experiences taught me that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I have a bunch of questions. Uh, Let's fast forward first to 07 Mm -hmm. and trial by fire. (laughs) Yes, definitely trial by fire. The night before everything went down, I was on the news desk uh, and I got a tip from a buddy of mine who was in a chorus line. Okay. And a chorus line is one of those shows without an intermission. It was one of the shows that came down early. So he said to me, he texted me and said, we have... Uh, a mandatory meeting after tonight's performance. Now, we knew something was going to happen with the stagehands, but we did not know when. Yeah. And he texted me, said, strikes on for tomorrow. Now, it had not been reported at that time. Mm. And I was on the news desk, and I immediately went to my manager and said, the stagehand strike is on tomorrow. And because we are really the only game in town that covers Broadway, off-Broadway, New York theater, like no one else on television... Um, yeah, you really are. <laughs> we we took that to heart, or we went with that, yeah. and we broke in, and we actually beat the New York Times and the AP by twenty something minutes, oh. and then we knew the strike was on, and so the next day they sent me out into Times Square, and for three weeks straight, you know, I covered this strike day in day out. Um, I camped out in a news truck in Times Square. Because I knew all the players, because I knew I, I had been covering this industry and obviously know all the producers and the behind yeah. the scenes folks, uh, it'd be a situation where in the morning, you know, the news crews would show up and they had no idea who these people were. And they would tap on my door in the news truck and like ask for an update or just follow me wherever I went because we were getting exclusives left and right. But these general assignment reporters had yeah. no idea who the players were. So or what they look like or what they look like. So <laughs> yeah. it was hard for them to get an update. And so funny. the strike uh, obviously ended. And that's when I got promoted into uh, becoming the producer of on stage, uh, which was right after that. And that's when you're now on air mm-hmm. reporting. Yeah. Was there was there even nerves at that point? Or you're just like doing your job. You're like, this is it. Well, I produced for a couple of years. And then my first on-air experience was I got invited down to do, uh, to cover and experience the Marriage Equality March in Washington, D.C. with the Company of Hair. Yeah. Uh, in an unprecedented situation, the producers of Hair shut down the show on a Sunday and they they invited the entire cast and crew to march and perform in the marriage equality rally in Washington DC and I got an invitation to go down on their bus we took a bus down Saturday night stayed over in the hotel it was an amazing experience and 
I documented the whole thing. And when I got back, they said, you know, because I, you know, I, I couldn't previous to that report on air because they did not have an on air contract. Right. But they said, this is something important that only you experienced. Why don't, you know, we make an exception to the role and why don't we put you on air? And then right after that, I started doing some on air stuff here and there. And then eventually I got my first on air contract. That's incredible. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's obvious the entire company has taken you under their wing, but did anyone in particular take you under their wing in terms of like, um, information, things to know, lessons learned, uh, thoughts, ideas, any, there are people here who have mentored me over the years and have taught me tools and tips to go live and, you know, present stories on air. Yeah. 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 I mean, so, okay. So my question then is, are you, and I, if you're willing to share this before you go live, are you like, is there a soft focus? Are you relaxed? Are you, you thoroughly prepared? So you're not even, you know, worried. <laughs> no, I, I think you always get it, It's I compare it to, and, and you're a theater guy, you get this. I compare yeah. it to like, you know, right before you take to the stage, it's like yeah. that same feeling that I felt, you know, when I used to be a performer in high school and grade school or in, in community theater you are a little nervous and that's good. You feed off of that. But yeah. the key is, and like many things you guys do in theater, it's breathe, just yeah. breathe and be prepared. And if you're prepared and you're calm, everything will run smoothly. Yeah. Well, yeah. And that, so and that runs into the other thing. So, and I've gotten this comment before from people I've interviewed is um, that I do my homework, you know, yeah. that I know something more than, you know, what's your favorite color? <laughs> That's right. Conversation. And you have to do an extensive amount of homework yeah. as you interview all of these people. Mm -hmm. um, has that gotten easier? Have you, do you have more of a method? Have you trimmed it down? You know, I, I, I have to say the way it's gotten easier is I have a, an incredible team at on stage and, yeah. you know, I've um, Cody Williams, Ariel and Weintraub and Kim Dugan who are, my producers and they're great and they help in terms of preparation. But you know, for years and years and years, I was a one man band and I did it all by myself. And honestly, I think it's a combination of, you know, I was that kid at home who read every single playbill from cover to cover, every single playbill that I got growing up. And so it's funny, all that information comes into play now with my job. I can recall, oh yeah, in 1992, you won the Tony Award for X, Y, and Z. Um, so that of course comes into play yeah. when I'm interviewing actors or directors or creatives. But also, yes, you know, you go into a room, you sit down with a Patti LuPone, she expects that you know what project she's working on yeah. and that you are up to speed on everything or don't interview her and she's absolutely right you know mm -hmm. so yes doing your homework preparation is very key when it comes to this business i believe it how has it gotten easier or just simply changed from being a new face to being you know one of the gang <laughs> i think just you know like you said it becoming one of the gang and being able to walk in a room and people know who i'm with what the brand is you know what we do um you know, our show is now uh, multi-award winning. We, we won our first Emmy in 2018. So I, I feel like yeah. people know what I do and why I'm there. So yeah. that in and of itself has become easy. How has um, social media changed the game from, I mean, recently, even yeah. from 07 to now? You know, I teach at Fordham University of Lincoln Center. I'm an adjunct professor there. I teach theater journalism and I always say, you know, watching, because I started teaching there in 2013 and just watching over the past few years how much the industry has changed. I mean, even now here at New York One, there's a lot of focus on social media and kind of doing that cross connection between what we post on social media and kind of throwing that or alerting our viewers to mm. our content on air through social media and I think that's important and you know just kind of having a presence and having a brand right we're right. all you know I, I cover this business and people know what I cover and I hope my social media reflects that and just making sure that everything that I post is on brand with you know my content and what I do here at New York One. Are there uh, like misconceptions or common misconceptions or 
pieces of you know advice that you're trying to change for upcoming students at Fordham? I should say more themes you're focusing on yeah. that are important for journalism. I would say you know whether you're going to be a theater journalist or a sports journalist or film journalist, mm. cover politics, know your beat, know your craft. You know, again, similar to what I was just saying about walking into a room with a major award-winning performer, you got to know your stuff if you're going to sit down with these major people. They, of course, are accomplished in their own right. You want to go in and prove yourself to them and also be able to have a smart conversation with them. Right. So I always tell my students, it's important to be prepared to know your stuff. But also on the flip side, you know, when it comes to social media, you're in college. Be careful with what you put out there. You know, once you post something on the Internet, I don't care if it's quote unquote instant or it's supposed to be permanent. It's going to live out there. So, you know, these young aspiring journalists who I talk to each week at Fordham, I say, just be careful with what you put out on the web. Yeah, that's so true. It's all right. <laughs> it's all documented. These Nothing days. disappears. Literally Nothing disappears. It's there forever. Okay. Um, are there, is there programming that you would like to see more of or programming you appreciate on television in terms of journalism reporting and or otherwise you know the broadway community and the theater community here is so strong so solid you know broadway brings in more money there's this crazy statistic broadway brings in more money into new york city than all the major new york city sports teams combined yearly and i think because of that statistic alone you know broadway is a major player with the city it's part of the fabric the culture of this incredible place we live in mm. so you know i'm just i don't know if i want to see more theater on tv selfishly because i feel like we do it and we do it um the right way <laughs> yeah but i just have to say in in tooting my team's own horn here I love what I do and I love what I cover and I love the stories that we get to tell. And if we can continue to do, to do that and to do it, keep taking it to the next level. I'd be, I'd be happy with that. Yeah. What have you learned about human communication through all of these interviews that you've had? It's going to sound so simple, but being nice goes a long way. Yeah. Having a smile on your face and being nice goes a long way. That's important. That's so important. Do you have uh, any standout stories, favorite moments of yourself <laughs> from this From career? work. Yeah. From work. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm going to show you something right here. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see it. Hold on. For folks listening, I'm pulling out my iPhone. Do you know what that is? Oh, my goodness. It's Elaine Stritch. Oh, my goodness. Um, one of my favorite <laughs> memories of... The job was getting to know Lane Stritch over the years. And, you know, this picture that was taken uh, was right before she passed away. And she had a documentary. Alec Baldwin helped get a documentary out on her. And the documentary was coming out. And she had requested that I come over to her, uh, the place where she was staying for an interview. And she was actually she had moved just moved to Michigan back home to Michigan she retired but she came, was in town because she was having surgery for cancer it was like kind of the one last try before she passed away and i got to the house she was staying in on the upper east side and she made me get in bed with her and we did the whole interview just laying down in bed and we just I remember being there for you know 3 or 4 hours and just laughing with her and talking about her crazy stories and her crazy life. And the conversation got to the point where I would just say, all right, Elaine, tell me about Judy Garland. And she'd say, you know, Judy and I love to party. We knew how to drink. (laughs) We would stay up all night into the morning. And she was a very good friend. Or I would say, Judy, uh, Elaine, tell me about JFK. JFK, he wanted more than I wanted to give Frank, like, and just kind of went on, went on with that. She, 
I mean, this is a woman who knew so many iconic people over the course of her life and was an icon in her own right. So getting to, you know, get to talk to Elaine Stritch before she passed mm -hmm. in that kind of setting, same thing happened. Uh, I got to know Carol Channing towards the end of her life uh, and went to go visit her in Rancho Mirage where she was living with a nurse or, you know, how, getting to interview Hal Prince, you know, half a dozen times and how writing me every time, you know, he saw the interview or our chat pop up on the screen on New York One. Those kind of experiences, I will forever be grateful for this place for. You know, these are, as that young boy growing up in Philadelphia who loved the theater, who grew up, you know, reading these names in his playbills or on his cast albums, you know, only dreaming to, to maybe one day be a part of it. Yeah. The fact that this place has given me that, um, and, and, you know, I've been able to tell stories of these people because of New York One, I will honestly forever be grateful. That's incredible. Was that uh, like a fully recorded conversation with Elaine? It was. The whole it was, yeah. It was just you, her, and the yeah. a few camera people. <laughs> one, one, for this, it was one camera person. That's incredible. Yeah. yeah. How many times had you spoken to her? Um, I got to know her. I met Give her. Give or take. I, mean, I, yeah. met her for the, I met her for the first time in 2008. It yeah. was actually one of the first stories I got to do when I took over as the producer of On Stage. And... She was performing her show, her solo show at the Cafe Carlisle, and I went up to the Cafe Carlisle and was filming the show, and I was supposed to interview her after the show. But midway through, when there was an intermission in the performance, I started feeling sick. And I was like, but I can't go back to the station without this interview with Elaine Stritch. We're, they're relying on me for this the piece cover. this uh, this piece for our news portion of the show and I need it. And, yeah. you know, it was, I think early January, so there wasn't much else going on. So we, we, we needed this story. So I remember turning to the publicist saying, I don't feel well, I'm getting sick. I think it was food poisoning. Yeah. Um, I need to interview her at her intermission in her suite. And he said to me, he's like, Frank, that's not going to happen. I said, you don't understand. I can. I just got this position. I cannot go back to the station without a soundbite from Elaine Stritch. I need to do this. And he was like, let me see what I can do. Five minutes later, he says, okay, Elaine wants you to see her. You can do the interview, but be quick. So I go and I set up my camera. And this was the, back in the day when I was a one-man band. I go in, set up my camera, and she goes, I hear you're sick. I said, yes. She was like, well, stay away from me. I'm going to hold the microphone. So she like, she's in the back of the room. I'm on the other end of the room. She's holding the microphone. We do the whole interview, and then she says, all right, I need my staff to get Frank orange juice, an apple, water. Frank, don't go anywhere. We need to take care of you. And she literally packed me a to-go bag when I was leaving the Carlisle and I just thought oh my gosh this woman is amazing I mean anyone who knows Elaine Stritch knew that she or knew Elaine Stritch knew that she she could talk like a truck driver to put it nicely yeah. you know there was no holding anything back but this woman kind of just took care of me in this moment and then every single time she was at the Carlisle I would come and see her and interview her and um you know, I have stories upon stories like this where, you know, she would just, you know, she'd poke fun at me. But we at the end of the day, we would just have these amazing interactions. And then, like I mentioned, this picture on my phone would was you, the final one. Would you say it blossomed into a friendship? Yeah, I mean, a professional friendship. But she was she was amazing and she was very open with me. And, and I appreciated that. And, you know, this is, she was one of the greats of the stage, oh my you God. know, one of the greats of the theater. So that's incredible. Yeah. And that happens, I would imagine frequently. I mean, it's incredible to have, you know, to interview someone, right. And then to become, you know, professionally yeah. friends with them yeah. and have these like relationships, yeah. so to speak. Yeah. Um, what are your views on professional relationships in the industry mm -hmm. of theater news, et cetera? You know, I think, and this has worked to my advantage, you know, being friends with people in the industry and, you know, having a network of folks in the industry 
and I can only speak about the theater and entertainment industry, has only helped, you know, the way I tell stories. Of course, being a professional is key, but, you know, at the end of the day, it's my beat. So just yeah. like someone here in New York, one who's covering, say, the MTA or someone's covering the NYPD, you know, you need to create a network of folks yeah. who you can rely on, who are your sources. And for me, that's the theater community. And in terms of the job of a journalist, you need to be able to call on these folks to get information from. And so it's very important. Mm. Do you have a favorite question or questions that you ask? I'm always curious, you know, I. It's kind of basic, but I just, I love to know how people got started in the business. You know, what were they doing before they became, again, a Patti LuPone? Elaine or, Stritch. Or Elaine <laughs> Stritch or a Bernadette Peters. Yeah. You know, how did they get to where they are today? You know, what shows were they doing when they were in high school? What were their favorite shows growing up? Um, Have you found common themes of those answers? And anything? I mean, just off the top of my head, you know, um, depending on what we're covering. I remember um, back when Something Rotten, the musical came out, of course, it was the celebration. It was really a love letter to the musical theater. And I remember, you know, asking a bunch of folks involved, you know, what was the musical for you when you were growing up? Like, what was, when did you know that this is what you had to do because you saw this particular musical? And the same two answers kept coming back. It was Sweeney Todd and Gypsy. So, <laughs> What's your favorite show, by the way? Phantom of the Opera. Really? That's the first one I saw. Okay, so we have that in common. We do. I've seen it four times. Oh, wow. Four times? Four times. I mean, yeah. it's it's brilliantly staged. You know, you think yeah. about how Prince and, you know, 21 Tonys later, the man was a genius. It's an epic. Mm -hmm. Watching the, hearing the overture and watching the transformation yeah. every time. I mean, it's only, it's not only, it's only drops. Yeah. You know? I, well, that's, that's the thing. You know, how Prince just said to me, he was like, Frank, at the end of the day, it's just a black box. It's just a black box. I love that interview with him where he was talking about the doves or the yes. pigeons or whatever. Yes. They're going to fly out yes. and go up. And he's like, and they're like, yeah, yeah, the train, they're going to go up into the rafters. And not then they so went much. down to the seats. Not so much. And he might be the only person to have fired birds. Right. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, that's that was that was the one though, Phantom of the Opera, and the the keeping keeping things tight, mm -hmm. staying with the narrative, which is what makes a good music, that's musical, true. song, movie, or even an interview. That's true. Is that's true. Cutting out all that extra, you know, stuff and sticking to whatever that theme of the day is. Yeah. In life, um, what's most important to you? I think this again sounds cliche, but you know, family and friends. Um, being happy, health. You know, over the past couple of years, I've seen, you know, family members, friends, you know, get ill and some pass on. And, you know, I think our time here on this earth is limited and, and precious. So you have to embrace what's important in life. And for me, that's family, friends, mm. happiness and health. Yeah. Have there been changes in your life that have increased positivity and decreased negativity? You know, I think for that, I just say, you know, it's so important to surround yourself with positive people. You know, it's, it's kind of it's true. stripping away the fat and just, you know, Keeping, I'm a firm believer in positive energy, so keeping positive energy around me. I like to give off positive energy, and I like having that coming at me. Yeah. Or do you have a like a morning ritual? Sounds a little serious, but things you do regularly to keep yourself centered throughout the day. And I love working out. You know, especially Monday through Friday. Um, I have a routine every morning that I do. I'm a CrossFitter, so I, I do my CrossFit, CrossFit, and that's kind of like my moment to myself every morning, and um, that's Monday through Friday, and then on Sundays, I love to go for a long run. I try to do that every Sunday in oh. the park. Oh, yeah. Okay, Central. I live I live right off of Central Park. I love it. So, That's wonderful. Yeah. Um, favorite book? Books? Any come to mind? 
I'm going to give a shout out to my buddy Andrew Reynolds, who I just read his memoir. Yeah. Uh, or I should say, it's probably part one of his memoir. It's the <laughs> early years of coming to New York City. And I just think it's a beautiful, honest coming of age story of a young gay man coming to New York City and figuring out who he is. And um, Andrew is a great writer. It's so funny. I read I read the book uh, in coming back from a trip from the UK not too long ago, and just I could not put it down. So um, that's the first thing that comes to mind. I love it. I love it. Um, traveling. Do you do a lot of traveling? I love to travel. You have favorite I love spots? to travel. Yeah. Um, I love Europe. I, it was just in the south of France on vacation. It was my big summer trip. And yeah, I, I, I love to travel. I try and get myself on a plane whenever I can. What do you love about it? Just kind of going someplace else, learning about a different culture, experiencing a different culture, meeting new people, being able to unplug. You know, I, I consider the, the Broadway season really like the school season. So September through May with graduation happening at the Tony Awards in June. So the summer is re really the time where I can kind of like unwind a little. And I love doing a big trip in the summer and kind of recharging. And now, you know, as we're doing this interview at the end of August, it's time to pick up and I'm, I'm ready for a new season. I'm, I'm, I'm so excited. I'm, it's, there's a lot of great stuff opening. So I can't, get, can't wait to get back to work. I know there's going to be so many. It's an inter We were talking a little bit before. It's going to be an interesting season. Yeah, and and things it's, just keep getting announced. So I know it's exciting. Yeah, it's it's just and it's you know what's really exciting. The more people you know and the more friends you're making in the industry That's to right. see them pop. It's like oh oh like a Broadway briefing. It's yeah. a wonderful. I subscribe to it. Yeah. And my friend Corey Jacoma is going into Beautiful, and it's just like it's right there. And it's like you know when you start to recognize these names, it's kind of like. Yeah. I'm part of it. Yeah. I'm part of the community. It's cool. It's one of the gang. Yes, that's right. Uh, metaphorically speaking, is there a word or a phrase that you'd put on a billboard for millions of people to see? I think it'd be yes. Period. Say yes. So many doors have opened for me because I said yes. Hmm. And for right now, I would say it's yes. Frank, this has been a wonderful conversation. And thank you. Thank you. For saying yes. <laughs> no, seriously. And I really, I, you're absolutely right. Say yes. There, all too often people are saying no. No to getting out of bed to go to an audition. No to an opportunity, any opportunity. And I think it's really important yeah. to say yes. Thank you. Thank you. This is fun. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, Frank Delella. You've been listening to Entertainment X, the podcast. You can follow Entertainment X on Instagram at underscore Entertainment X underscore. If you haven't yet, go to Apple Podcasts and subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. Join Clay next week for another Curiosity Conversation on Entertainment X. Thank you for listening.